Good evening. I welcome everybody to the Library of Congress tonight. I'm, I'm glad to see so many people showing up. You've got almost all the seats covered. That's, that's great. <laughs> and uh, I am Grant Harris. I am chief of the European Division here at the Library of Congress over in the Jefferson Building, the oldest of the three buildings. So um, this talk tonight is about Charles King's book, Gods of the Upper Air, how a circle of renegade anthropologists reinvented race, sex, and gender in the 20th century. This event is, is co-sponsored by four divisions in the library. We all wanted into this. Uh, it's, 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 it's pretty good. Uh, first of all, we really have to say manuscript division because Charles King used the Margaret Mead papers uh, extensively on this. Very important. Also, the Researcher and Reference Services Division the Rare Book and Special Collections Division, and my division, the European Division. So let me say a few things about Charles. Charles is a professor of international affairs and government at Georgetown University. He's the author of seven critically acclaimed books. His first book dealt with the country of Moldova and was a result of his doctoral dissertation at, at Oxford. Uh, three of his other books were published by Oxford University Press. Most of his works have dealt with places around the Black Sea and the Black Sea itself. The book we're talking about this evening explores something far removed from the Black Sea. Uh, again, the title, Gods of the Upper Air, How a Circle of Renegade Anthropologists Reinvented Race, Sex, and Gender in the 20th Century. Uh, and it has received lots of good coverage. I know New York has uh, covered it a lot. The New Yorker, the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Washington Post had a very positive review about it. Um, so it looks at the development of the field of anthropology in, in the United States through the groundbreaking work of Franz Boas, who came from Germany, and his students at Columbia University. So I would ask you to help me welcome Professor Charles King. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Charles, Black Sea and all these, these books about places around it, the Black Sea itself. So how did you jump to anthropology? Yeah, well, I think, <clears throat> I, think I married an anthropologist, which is probably the most important um, answer to that question. But over time, you know, I realized that over the course of my career with these other books, I'd, really, I'd written about nationalism, ethnicity. I was interested in how societies developed and collapsed. Um, my first time out of the United States when I was a teenager was to the Soviet Union. Um, and I kind of became an expert in a way in going to places and watching them disintegrate in, very, in various <laughs> ways, unfortunately. Um, and the forces that were so critical to that kind of politics, national identity, um, a sense of ethnic belonging, language, which was really the subject of my, my first book, and how people could get so upset over how you spell a word, or whether you use this alphabet or that alphabet, or whether some mythical being who existed in a, a shrouded past was real or not, or belonged to you versus belonged to me. You know, so many in the 1990s, these issues were critical to the politics of the parts of the world that I knew something um, about. And I thought that, you know, the, the thing that is animating my interest in this is how all of this happens. How, how do people take invented versions of human difference and raise them to the level of high politics or raise them to a state in which they're willing to die or kill other people on the basis of these things? How can people get so worked, over the, worked up over these things over issues that are ephemeral, right? That, are, that seem on the surface of things so incredibly thin, so not rooted in actual human experience? How can people, in other words, decide that they wake up one morning and suddenly they're this thing rather than that thing, and that's the most important bit of their life? You know? um, and I thought I've written a number of books about a part of the world where these things have been very much at the forefront of politics over the last 20 or 30 years. 
Um, but they're also at the forefront of politics in my own country, my own homeland, in a rather different way, right? I mean, we, we have a different set of social categories in the United States, race principally, the one that from its foundation, this country wrapped itself around and expended incredible energy trying to create and police over the course of the last two centuries. Um, and having seen how ethnicity, language, religion, nationality work in other places, I kind of, I wanted to turn back to, to my own home and see how those things work. I will say that when I first started working on this book, it had an incredibly triumphalist kind of air to it. Because I go back to the early proposal in 2015, 2014, 2015 or so, and I was gonna tell the story of how we had all become so enlightened, right? I was gonna tell this triumphalist story of how we got over all of these divisions of the past. And then of course 2016 happened. And I realized that the book was so much more about the present moment, about the struggle over defining these divisions. Okay, good answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, let's turn to the, the man at the center of this, Franz Boas, born in Germany, uh, receives his doctorate in physics in 1881, and uh, then decides he wants to work on uh, other kinds of things, and, and heads off to uh, the ba Baffin Island, the fifth largest island in the world, uh, north of Hudson Bay. It's part of Canada. Never heard of it before. And uh, does his work with, on the, with the Inuit uh, on the island there. So, but give us some, a bit more background about Franz Boas and, and then his first forays into research there. Yeah. Well, so Boaz was born into a middle-class Jewish family in Westphalia and what would become um, Germany by the 1870s. Um, he was born in 1858. He was born in um, a kind of interesting historical moment because he was born at the moment kind of of reaction against the liberal revolutions that had taken place a decade earlier, the great revolutions of 1848, which had by and large failed all across Europe. Um, people who had been supporters of um, the liberal values of 1848 often went into exile when the forces of autocracy reasserted themselves. And some of uh, Boaz's family members were in that group, often journalists, writers, um, lawyers, members of the liberal professions who had fled to other countries in Europe from the German lands or even as far afield as the United States. And so Boaz had some relatives, physicians and others who had, who had moved to New York um, after the failure of uh, those revolutions across the, the continent. Um, he should have gone into the family business, which was a kind of import-export business on his mother's side, uh, trading fine goods between Germany and uh, the east coast of the United States. And um, like so many um, children who have a pathway uh, decided for them by their parents, he decided not to take it. Um, went off to university, then did a doctorate, as you said, in physics, and then decided that he would be a kind of adventurer. He had no particular idea of what this would entail, but he knew you had to go to some place that was essentially unlike the place you happen to be living and write back about it. So he, he contracted with a German newspaper to write sort of sensational stories from the field. This was the era of, of Stanley and Livingston, um, you know, great adventurers discovering new lands and writing about it in overwrought prose for readers back home. And that's exactly what he wanted to do. <laughs> and so um, his father reluctantly agreed to finance this on the provision that he take the family servant along. And he did, Wilhelm Weike, who went with him. Um, and he set off for the Canadian Arctic with the idea that he would write maybe a few scientific papers. He would write these dispatches for um, the, the newspaper and sort of make his way as a noted adventurer. You know. um, and he got there and things turned out rather, rather differently. It was very, very hard um, to, uh, to survive there, to find something good to eat, even with your servant um, <laughs> alongside you. Um, he, of course, didn't know the language, although he had tried to make a brief study of it on the ship out. He spent the entire journey shipboard uh, seasick. Um, and then it took about a month or more to make it from the outside of the bay 
to land because of sea ice. So I mean, you sort of have to imagine you're in a sailing ship, you know, going to the Arctic in this in this age. It was a great adventure, <coughs> indeed, but rather disappointing when he got there. But over the course of about a, almost two years that he spent on Baffin Island, he had a little bit of a of, of a revelation, in fact, a very, rather profound revelation. And that is, it gradually occurred to Boaz that back home in Germany with a doctorate in physics, he was among the elite. He was smart. He could go to learned conferences. He would, could write learned uh, papers. But here, he was really stupid. Um, he didn't know how to survive on the sea ice. He didn't know what was good to eat. I mean, he didn't even know how to harness a dog sled team. Who doesn't know how to harness a dog sled team, right? You have to be a child not to know how to do that. And he was that. He was a child in this place. He wasn't a fully formed human being. And he wrote back to his fiancée, Marie Krakowitzer, in, in New York um, that he had this profound discovery that there is an essential relativity to what we call civilized behavior, or an essential relativity to what we think being intelligent or smart or being a full adult is, because he had just experienced what it's like not to be those things. If you, if you want to change your station in life, change your location in life. And he experienced that in, a, in such a profound way. And it's the idea that would then filter in th all through his later scholarship and, and the, the essential message that he would pass down to his students. I was happy just to read that rather than go there. It was just, it was just grim and brutal and <laughs> yeah, cold. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, I felt pretty stupid too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so he finishes there. Mm -hmm. And then he does head to New York, where his fiance mm -hmm. is there. Eventually marries sometime later when, yep. he, when he feels like he's somebody, I yep. guess. Um, but, but he's not yet where we know he's headed uh, many years later at Columbia University. So tell us the different things he did over a, a number of years there to be, different projects. Nothing was a permanent job. No, no. I mean, like, like most folks with a PhD, then and now, he spends a fair amount of time being an itinerant. I mean, um, and, and this is very upsetting to him because you know he arrives in New York Harbor from Baffin Island. The, uh, his future in-laws are there to welcome him. And he has to kind of break it to them that, yeah, he's had this great adventure, but he doesn't have a paying uh, job. And um, he, again, like most beginning academics, he starts writing papers. He tries to network, um, and he's a very talented um, and, and energetic networker, but his English was not very good. In fact, one of the most embarrassing moments for him in this period when he first came to the United States in the early 1880s is as um, giving a paper uh, before an audience here in Washington of the Washington Anthropological Society of what would eventually become the American Anthropological Association. And, um, and he has to have someone read it out because his English is not even good enough to read a paper before an audience in, in this, to him, foreign language. So um, he tries to network people at the Smithsonian. There are no jobs going. And he's a, really a bit of a failure until um, he is invited, eventually a few years later, to um, be involved in a big exhibition that's taking place in Chicago which we know as the Chicago World's Fair, the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. And he's part of the group of anthropologists, which is a term he is beginning to use for himself rather than just geographer or traveler or adventurer, who will be responsible for putting together the first large building that ever has the word anthropology written across the front of it. In fact, when people go to the Chicago World's Fair and go into the Anthropology Building, it's really the first time most Americans have walked under a sign that has that label um, attached, uh, attached to it. So he's involved in bringing collections together. He had spent, he had begun to spend time on nor the Northwest Coast um, here in North America. That would eventually also become a, another major field site uh, for him in his, in his research work. 
But that also turns out to be really a bit of a failure for him because when the fair closes down and a fair amount of it burns, as it, um, as it turns out, um, he's not invited to join the museum that's set up after the fair, what will become the Field Museum in Chicago. That, those jobs go to, to other people and he's sort of left out in the cold. He works as a, an assistant editor at Science Magazine for a while, um, gets on the wrong side of most of the establishment in the world of anthropology and geography by criticizing their work, particularly the way that the National Museum is being set up here in Washington. We know it, of course, as the Smithsonian um, Museum of uh, Natural History, which he's very critical of in the way that it's organized, um, and is then, again, kind of out of, the, out of a job until family members step in and through their connections he gets a junior part-time lectureship at Columbia University in the late 1890s. So two of the people that you, you talk about who, with whom he polemicized would be John Wesley Powell yep. and Madison Grant. Yeah. So d describe to us the polemics that are going on there. Well, so Powell is this fascinating figure in American a history in American history of American science, um, a great American na uh, naturalist, um, had been an officer during the Civil War, um, lost uh, an arm um, to a cannonball during the, the Civil War, um, was the first person to make a recorded uh, journey down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon with one arm, um, with the sort of one arm on the tiller of the boat going uh, down the down the river, and then um, becomes the head of a thing called the Bureau of American Ethnology, originally called the Bureau of Ethnology, Bureau of American Ethnology at the Smithsonian. And he's one of the people that Franz Boas tries to buttonhole and has to tell him that I'm, unfortunately there are no jobs um, uh, left for you. But Powell was um, a major figure in um, the establishment of the, the kind of research infrastructure at the Smithsonian for what we would now, uh, what we would now call ethnography or anthropology, the sort of collecting of, of languages, of stories, of, um, of, of artifacts that define particular cultural groups around, particularly around the United States, because that was the real focus of his work. But Boaz polemicizes with him and a couple of other key Smithsonian figures over the basic structure of what a, a natural history museum should look like. Because in Boaz's day, if you went into a library or a museum of natural history, you were being told a story about human progress. You would be told a story of progress from so-called primitive people to so-called civilized people who happened just to look like Americans circa late 19th century. It was the story of how earlier versions of ourselves are still spread around the world. Right? So you go to so-called primitive societies around the world, you're taking a, a trip through time. You know, you're seeing an earlier version of yourself, of your language, of your food ways, of your culture. They're laid out before you. And that's the story that you would see played out in a museum. In fact, if you go over to the Jefferson Building, you can see it played out even today. Take a walk, go across the street, take a walk around the exterior of the, of the Jefferson Building, and you will see this literally carved in stone on the facade of the greatest institution of human knowledge in the world. If you look at the keystones of the second story windows around the exterior of the building, they are formed of 33 ethnological heads representing the major types of humanity that were in Powell's collections in the, in the Smithsonian. Um, it will perhaps not surprise you, thinking of that building opening in the 1890s in the United States, that folks we would now call white people are on the front of the building. Folks of visibly African and Melanesian heritage are on the back of the building, and so-called intermediate races or peoples then wrap around the sides. It is a visual representation of the way in which people thought of the ranking of human types by civilization, by race, by ethnicity, by culture in that era. And Boaz said, this is nonsense. That, that if you take a, a bone rattle, 
let's say. You find a bone rattle that exists in a Lakota Sioux society, it exists in a sub-Saharan African society, and it exists in, uh, it exists in China. You can think that you're seeing a version of the same thing, that a bone rattle is a bone rattle is a bone rattle. And so a museum, you, can, you might believe, ought to put all those bone rattles together because they represent the same stage in some kind of human cultural evolution, right? Because we know really civilized people only use toys created by Fisher Price, right? <laughs> not a bone rattle. But Boaz said, well, these are not the same thing, even though you might think they are. This thing is used to quiet a crying baby. This is the thing that's used to summon a rain god. This is the thing that's used to scare your enemy, right? These are not the same object. And when museums would put them together to tell the story of alleged human progress, they're misunderstanding. So the way we organize a museum today, where we might organize it by language or put all uh, the members of one cultural group together or one geographic group together, that was the argument that Boaz was making. And he lost that argument to Powell in the 1880s and 90s. So I should, I, I'm so long-winded. Shall I say a couple of words about Madison Grant, though? Do. OK. <laughs> Madison Grant is a different um, character, but not that different in his basic assumptions. So Madison Grant, also one of the great naturalists uh, in the early 20th century um, in the United States, uh, one of the founders of the Bronx Zoo, uh, great friend of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, we probably owe the survival of the American bison to Madison Grant because he was a great advocate for creating these spaces in the American West where these noble creatures could uh, survive, and lobbied Congress for the creation of conservation areas and so on. Um, but as he traveled around his native city, um, New York, he was a native New Yorker, he began to realize that he was seeing in New York in the teens of the last century the same set of problems that he had witnessed in traveling around the American West. He had seen what happened when noble native species were brought down by invaders. He had seen what happened when your habitat was polluted by stealthy outsiders. And he wrote a book in 1916 called The Passing of the Great Race that took his understanding of American natural history and conservation areas and applied it to the problem of, of race and immigration in the United States. The Passing of the Great Race, which tells this racial history of Europe based on the idea that countries, so long as they took care to preserve their native species, these noble creatures which grew up suited to a particular time and particular place that represented the greatest achievements that that society could produce. So long as they took care to preserve that, those societies lasted for a long time and, and, and achieved greatness. Um, they were ultimately brought down when they allowed in too many foreigners, to put it, um, to put it bluntly. Um, of course, for Madison Grant, the Native American is a term he uses in The Passing of the Great, Days, uh, Great Race. Native American meant people like him, right? people of Anglo-Saxon um, um, immigrant heritage, but particularly sort of Anglo-Saxon white people. Um, and The Passing of the Great Race turned out to be a, a bestseller. It was one of those books that in 1916 or so, if you were aware, if you were a world aware person, you know, and you wanted to read kind of the big book of the season, The Passing of the Great Race was that big book you should read. Um, Boaz reviewed it very, very badly in The New Republic and elsewhere um, when he had the, had the chance. Uh, he said, this is simply nonsense on stilts. This is not based on actually any scientific understanding of human progress or race or uh, human social groups or anything. This is simply repeating the same kinds of problems that you see in the structure of, of a museum. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, Charles has pointed out to us, we have um, Hitler's copy of uh, Madison Grant's book. It was a translation into to German. Uh, it came out in 1925 in, yeah. in Munich. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Julius Siegfried, or is that his yeah, name? Lehmann. Uh, Lehmann. Yeah, Lehmann. Yeah, it was the publisher. And um, Mr. Lehmann was publishing books that were um, promoting the, the, the Nazi uh, racist uh, 
theories. And, and so Hitler was right there in town also in Munich. And uh, these books just flowed right over to, to Hitler. And, and we have Hitler's copy. And, and Mr. Lehman has actually written um, to, to Adolf Hitler and uh, with his own name, Lehman, at the, at the end of it. So, yeah. Um, and so uh, Hitler actually wrote to Madison Grant after that. And we don't have we don't have the original letter because it was later destroyed by Grant's um, uh, uh, relatives after his death. But we we have it on pretty good authority from someone who saw it on Grant's desk that Hitler had written this is this book I consider my Bible because it gave a racial interpretation of the entirety of Euro European history that fit very much with other things Hitler was reading at the time. Keep in mind, this translation comes out right at the time that Hitler is putting the final touches on Mein Kampf. So um, he's very much reading the racial science that is coming from the United States, from other parts of Europe, Europe at the time. And you know, that's, that, that's um, an important point because we have a tendency now in looking back a century ago on theorists, writers like Madison Grant and others, and think that they must have been so fringe to American self-understandings in that moment. Or we think of this as a dark chapter in American public life. But these were celebrated, widely read, um, uh, globally understood uh, writers and thinkers and theorists of the time. They were friends of the powerful. They influenced the powerful. This was the dominant way, not the fringe way, of thinking about race and culture, civilization, human progress, and, and, and so on. The American eugenics movement, which comes out of so much of this theoretical space in the uh, teens and 20s into the early 30s of the last century, is all part of the same kind of, uh, kind of milieu. So let's get uh, Franz Boas to, to Columbia University. He's, yeah. he's there, 1897. Um, he uh, has uh, initially just male students. The, 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 the basic part of Columbia University had only uh, taught only men. Uh, and actually, up until the 1980s, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, in 1920, he writes to a colleague and says, my best students are women. So explain this to us. Yeah, so um, of course, Columbia was a historically white male college or university. It was uh, one of these institutions built for the education of young men, particularly the education of young white men. It was an institution like so many that had restrictions on Jewish enrollment um, until well into the 20th uh, century. Um, and Boaz. Uh, who becomes a professor there in the late 1890s, gradually leaves his other job, which was at the American Museum of, of Natural History, and then begins working full time um, at, at Columbia to develop what will become the anthropology department. Initially, psychology, sociology, anthropology are kind of all lumped together. And then Boaz uh, uh, gradually begins to develop out just the anthropology component um, of, uh, of the courses and the research that's happening there. And then the First World War um, happens. And Boaz is a great opponent of the First World War and writes a whole series of articles and uh, what we now call op-eds and letters to the editor. He was a great letter to the editor writer. He was one of those guys um, who was constantly writing letters to the editor about various subjects uh, to the New York Times and elsewhere, um, saying that he could see no particular reason that the United States was preferring British imperialism to German imperialism. It just didn't make any sense to him why the United States was taking sides in this at all. And keep in mind that even though Franz Boas was, uh, was Jewish, the bit of his identity that mattered as of the First World War was his German identity, right? Being a German-speaking American, part of the largest European immigrant group in the United States, second largest after, after people like Madison Grant at the time. Um, and of course, during the war, once the United States enters the war, um, you know, German is outlawed in schools in many states in the United States. This teaching of German outlawed over telecom the speaking of German outlawed on the telephone and other forms of telecommunications. Uh, Germans prevented from living in uh, Washington, D.C. and other places. There are, there's a massive terrorist attack um, uh, on the outskirts of New York that's attributed to German agents. So this is a, you know, in, in a time of incredible fear 
and hatred toward this minority uh, community. And Boaz suffers as a result of that at Columbia. They uh, take most of his teaching at Columbia University itself away and send him across Broadway to the Women's College of Columbia Barnard, where it's thought he could, wouldn't do any damage at all if he were um, instructing undergraduate women. And that turns out to be the making of his career and also the making of the entire discipline of anthropology in the United States, because it's the women who come through his undergraduate seminars who are then drawn into this world that Boaz has, has, has created, um, this you know, magnetic sphere that he eventually creates. There. That's, that's how the women come into the department. What do they like about it, though? What inspires them? Well, you know, you think about the kinds of things he was, he was beginning to teach. The, the idea that there is no such thing as one universal best civilization, you know, which goes back to his Baffin Island days. The idea that the categories for understanding human life that we've created right here and right now that seem natural and obvious to us are not natural and obvious to other people. Um, the idea that in order to really understand humanity and all of its complexity, you need to throw yourself into a place that is as different from the one you take for granted as possible. So throw yourself to the other side of the world in a place uh, whose language you don't speak, a place that may not even have a written language. And if you think then of the, the teenagers, both men and women, who come into this sphere at the moment of the first youth revolt of the 20th century, right, the late teens and 20s, this is magical. These ideas are, are world upturning, right, for the flapper generation, people who are called at the time teeners, even teenagers at the time. This is mind expanding and a, a, a magical world encompassing vision of this new and after the First World War newly internationalist kind of society, right? So being drawn into that orbit allows you not only to feel that you're on the front edge of something really big, like a really new science of humankind that is a borning at, they're, they're in the seminar rooms at Columbia, but it's also a really, really great way to drive your parents crazy, right? <laughs> you know, because like all of the things they take for granted, their sense of morality, you're just turning that completely on its head. And that's what most of his students yeah. end up doing. One, one of his early students, uh, in a way, would be Ruth Fulton Benedict. Um, she actually then gets her own doctorate, becomes mm -hmm. a professor there. She's uh, um, an, an essential administrator, working very closely with uh, Boaz over the years, and uh, is really at the center. I think probably almost all, if not all, the students, men and women, are at some point talking with her. And, yeah some point. So yeah. tell us a few things about uh, her own research, her, her publications, her significance. Yeah. Well, so Benedict is, um, she had uh, done an undergraduate degree at, at Vassar, um, then married a medical professor at Cornell uh, Medical School and was living in kind of the outskirts of, of New York City and decided being uh, at the time a rather bored housewife with uh, a university degree, a college degree, but really not much to do with it, decided to start taking some classes downtown at a place called the Free School. Classes were free, they didn't give grades, just sort of start exploring some of these new ideas and the social sciences that were being taught there. We now know the Free School as the new school for social research. That's what it, it becomes. And she meets a whole series of thinkers, intellectuals, researchers there who, being impressed by some of the papers that she has written, say to her, you know, you should really consider doing a graduate degree. And maybe if you go uptown to Columbia, where a number of people who were teaching at the free school then had associations, there's this guy, Boaz, and you should sit in on a few of his seminars. And she does. She eventually completes her, her doctorate there and then becomes Boaz's kind of his chief um, teaching assistant. She eventually becomes an assistant professor. Um, it, uh, it requires her eventually being divorced uh, bef before she can, be she can become a, a full professor at, at Columbia because that was not open to women who happen to be married. Um, 
And she becomes kind of the essential partner, I think. And she's also the person, because she's teaching over at Barnard as well, um, the person also through whom many of the, of the next generation of students will meet Boaz. Let's talk about Margaret Mead mm. some. And uh, so she comes into the picture. Um, you've, you've devoted a lot of time to her. Yeah. She uh, goes off to conduct anthropological work on Pacific Islands comes back a couple times, uh, writes up a couple books, they're bestsellers, and she's already made her fame right there. T yeah. Tell us Well, tell us about uh, you know, I have to say this book would not at all have been possible without um, Margaret Mead's um, uh, chief um, obsession, which was collecting everything, like keeping absolutely everything. Um, so her collection here in the Manuscripts uh, reading room has about 500,000 items, 500,000 items in the me collection. I did not see but a fraction of those, but they're, they're incredible. And I have to take this opportunity to, to thank um, manuscripts, rare books, the general collection, European, thank you, um, for all of the, uh, the incredible resources that the library has in each of these um, domains. So, if you go through the Mead collection, what you find is not only everything to do with Margaret Mead's childhood, her childhood notebooks, her drawings that she might have done as a child, the papers of her, her parents, of, of friends and relatives, photographs from every aspect of her life, but also the papers of people with whom she was close, to whom she was married, uh, with whom she had affairs. Then she would sort of hoover up all of their papers, including all of their um, love letters and their hate mail and you name it. It's all, um, it's all in there and, and, and rather, uh, rather saucy in some instances. Um, so um, Mead you know, was an undergraduate at Barnard. She had actually, she was a transfer student, as we would call them today. Um, she had been at DePaul University. And um, she tells this amazing story in her memoirs of, of uh, pledging a, uh, a sorority which doesn't seem like a Margaret Mead thing to do. But uh, she was pledging a sorority. And she thought, well, for my, my pledge dance, the girls were sort of expected to demonstrate their sewing skills by making their own dresses. And of course, to pause in, the, in uh, Greencastle, Indiana. And she thought, how wonderful. She had come from uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where she grew up. Later in Philadelphia, she said, well, this is such an exotic place for me. I'll make a dress that looks like these amazing wheat fields dotted with poppy flowers. And that will be really fantastic. And she made such a dress for herself and then showed up at the pledge dance. And the other young women looked at her as if she had just stepped off of planet Xenon. It's sort of like. <laughs> You know, no right-thinking girl should want to look like Indiana um, at, at all. That is not what you should, you should be doing. And so she's rather, she realizes that Greencastle is not going to be the place for her. She was also um, engaged to a person in New York at that time who was in seminary. And so she, uh, she eventually transferred to uh, Barnard and almost immediately fell into the Boaz circle. She decided to take some anthropology classes. She met Ruth Benedict, um, who becomes um, a very close friend of hers um, uh, early on in uh, sort of a teaching assistant and a young undergraduate. Um, and then by 1925, the two of them have begun a relationship, um, a romantic relationship. And that they will uh, stay in that, at the time, unnameable romantic relationship really for the rest of, uh, rest of their lives. Well, Benedict passed away in the late 1940s. But they are the kind of essential pole star of each other's lives. And, and I reproduce in the book a thing that I found in the Mead papers that I hadn't seen uh, reproduced before. But it's a remarkable document. Mead, at some point later in her life, sat down to draw all of her influences. Um, so she draws this kind of chart with all of the people, a scatter diagram with all of the key people in her life. And you know, a single line for intellectual influence, a dotted line for friendship, a double line for lovers. So you can really map this uh, set of Mead relationships. And sitting kind of at the center of this map is Mead herself and Benedict. It's like this sort of twin sons kind of revolving. Um, around each other. And the time they really make their love known uh, to each other fully uh, is when the two of them 
are on a train together setting off across the United States, Benedict to go out to the American Southwest to do some research in Zuni, in the Zuni Pueblo, and Meade on her way to catch a ship on the West Coast to go to American Samoa, which is the first time that she will have gone to the Pacific Islands. Three years later, she publishes the book that will begin to make her career coming of age in Samoa in 1928. It's all fascinating, though, those parts of the book. Yeah, it's, it, it is saucy, as you say. There's, there's, there's lots there, but we'll have to pass by that sauce for right now. Well, you know, it, I, I, the, I was fascinated in reading. So you should never read anybody else's love letters. You should probably never, ever do that, um, because it, it makes you really embarrassed about things you might have written at some point in your own uh, life. But all of those things are in the, in the Mead uh, papers, right? Because yeah. she, um, she lived a full romantic life. Um, uh, and you know, she, she, as a result, I think, was one of the early people to question the idea of the fixedness of sexuality, the fixedness of gender, which are also issues that I get into the book through, um, through Mead's uh, writings. But to me, so many of the ideas that come out of this circle about the, the social construction of race, for example, the non-fixedness uh, of gender, um, the way in which sexuality does not come in one or just two varieties, but might come in many, the way in which we aren't the end point of any kind of natural form of social evolution, that people in so-called primitive societies can be quite happy and really, really smart. Um, all of these ideas come out of their lives, right? So you have to deal with their personal lives to understand where some of these ideas are coming from, right? I mean, Boaz, as this linguistically challenged German Jewish immigrant at the time of the First World War who can't find a job and is punished by the fathers of Columbia for his, his stance on the war, um, Mead and Benedict, um, in this loving same-sex relationship at the time, both of them are also married to men, and in Mead's case, will be married to, to other men over the course uh, of, her, of her life. They were misfits, for lack of a better word, in their own society, in their own time. They didn't fit properly into the categories that were meaningful in their time and space. And so they knew intimately what it was like not to fit. And all of them, at some point, have the, exactly the same realization that Boaz had on Baffin Island. And it's that either there's something wrong with me, right, that I don't fit in this time and place, and I'm essentially defective in some way, right? um, or there's something about the relationship between myself and the social context in which I find myself that defines why I'm feeling so lousy and out of place right at, right at the moment. And in that little germ of an insight is an entire social theory that comes exactly from their life experience. And you see it, you see it in the, you see it in the, the writings, you see it in the letters that they write back and forth and so on. I'd like to spend more time on that, but we've got to keep going. We're going to talk about uh, Zora Neale Hurston. She's quite quotable, actually, and I yeah, believe absolutely. Uh, uh, might you have used any words from her in the title <laughs> of your did. book? I did. She is responsible for the title of, of the book, Gods of the Upper Air, which is a, a little snippet from her autobiography, actually a snippet of the autobiography, of a bit of her autobiography that was excised before it was published in the United States, and thereby hangs a tale. But um, she's sort of reflecting on what she had learned over the course of her life. Um, she's writing her autobiography in the early 1940s, right in the middle of the war. She's reflecting on what she learned being part of this group of people around Papa Franz, as he was known to a, a lot of his students. And she has this beautiful quotation where she says, you know, I don't know that anything is true for all time. I don't know that I've, in my life experience, I've discovered anything that is universally true everywhere. But I know what's right for me. I have felt, she has this beautiful line where she says, I've felt the lightning on my fingertips. I've, I've, I've conversed with the gods of the upper air. I've looked at the world from on high. 
And so many of these differences that we think of as essential and timeless and universal just kind of melt away once you see the essential unity of human beings laid out uh, before you. She had, you know, she had grown up in Jim Crow, Florida. She had moved to Washington, D.C., worked in one of those great ironies of history as a waitress at John Wesley Powell's Dining Club. We know it as the Cosmos Club here in Washington, D.C., but she was a waitress at the Cosmos Club, um, took classes at Howard University, didn't graduate, um, and then moved to New York, kind of like Meade did, to make her a fortune, enrolled as the only African-American undergraduate at Barnard at the time, and likewise fell into this magnetic sphere of, uh, of Boaz, Meade, uh, uh, Benedict and, and, and others. And um, then Boaz eventually convinces her to stay on and do a, start working on a PhD, which she, uh, which she, she doesn't finish. But um, she described in the application for one of the two Guggenheim fellowships that she won that her field as she saw it was not just literature, although she had already published novels by this time in the 1930s, um, but her field was literary science, as she called it. And she spent then the late 20s, much of the 30s, going uh, to do field expeditions in the same way that Meade is doing in Samoa and Papua New Guinea and, and elsewhere, but in Hurston's case, on the Gulf Coast of the United States to Haiti and Jamaica. I wish we could spend more time on her, too, but we've got to keep going. This is all interesting. Uh, you, you, you cover one more. There are four women you cover, yep. especially, and the, and the last of these is Ella Deloria, who uh, was born and raised uh, on an Indian reservation in South Dakota. So tell us about her research. Yeah, so she's the same kind of figure, one of these um, young women hanging around Columbia in the 1920s. She's actually a student at Teachers College rather than at uh, Barnard. But um, Franz Boas, at some point around 1927-28, hears that there is a, a, a young woman at Teachers who uh, speaks uh, the Dakota and Lakota languages. Um, She's actually from the Dakota division of the, of the Great Sioux Nation. Um, and he sends for her. They meet there. She helps him with some translations. And she kind of falls out of his um, sphere for a while. But then they reconnect later on and begin working together on checking some of the great ethnographies of the late 19th century that had been written about Sioux peoples and the uh, in the American West. And Delore is such a fascinating figure because she's a kind of example of what we might call a, a native anthropologist, that is somebody from an indigenous community who then works as a professional ethnographer or, or anthropologist. Um, the, the big project the two of them work on together is a grammar of the Dakota language, which ends up being really critical for the preservation of and, and representation of that of those speech forms. It also happens to be one of the very, very few times that Franz Boas, over the entire course of his career, shares a byline with anyone. And the fact that it's with this <coughs> Dakota woman um, is, I think, particularly meaningful somehow. You know, Charles, I think uh, We'll just, I'll just ask you to wrap this up. Um, how can you sum up what this book does and, and what, these, what these renegade anthropologists yeah. uh, changed our thinking? Yeah, I mean, well, you can read the book in, in many different ways. I mean, it kind of is a history of American anthropology. It's a collective biography of this group of people. But um, it's also about this world changing way of living one's life and observing human society that this group of people was trying to get us to, to understand. Um, you know, they introduced this concept of cultural relativity, as, as Benedict calls it. She's the first to use that term. We now often use the term cultural relativism. It's critical to professional anthropologists as the basic you know, beginning point of seeing the world. It also, by the, by the 1980s, became part of the culture wars in the United States. People still you know, rail against the relativism 
of American university campuses and, and so forth. And people often think that that word implies that you can't make any decisions about anything. I mean, if, if morality, if ethics, if what uh, culture is, if what civilization is, is relative to a time and place, I mean, how can we say anything about anything and aren't we doomed to a kind of you know, nihilism as a result? And Boaz, you know, I always I wanted Boaz to meet Al, uh, Albert Einstein so the two of them could get together on these two different <laughs> versions of relativity. And um, wouldn't that be wonderful if they said, at some point, well, you're doing in physics what I'm doing in the social sciences. Uh, to my knowledge, they never met to have that conversation. But I realized over the course of writing this book that they're both getting at essentially the same thing. You know, Einsteinian relativity as a scientific proposition doesn't mean that there is no way of determining anything about anything. It doesn't mean that all the laws of the universe are relative. It means exactly the opposite, that the laws of the universe work wherever you are. Brilliant idea. The laws of the universe work exactly the same wherever you are. So when you see a fly you know, landing on your drink in an airplane, that fly is not standing still. <laughs> That fly is actually still subject to the laws of the universe. That fly is traveling at about 600 miles an hour, even though it looks to you like the fly is sitting still on your plastic drink cup on the airplane. Boas uh, was getting at a very similar thing. He said, the basic laws, if you want to use that term, of humanity are the same wherever we are. What's a good thing to eat? How do you die well? What do you do with your parents once they get old? What do the gods prefer to be called? What is that tree named? What kinds of animals can you be mean to, and what kinds of animals must you love? These are basic human questions that you find in every single society. They're human universals, if you want to put it that way. But the answers that we give to those questions here, now, in this society, right at this moment, are not universal. And that's the thing you have to hold in your head if you want to be a smart observer of human society. But it's also what you have to hold in your head if you want to be a moral human being, he said. There's no reason to expect that our own moral codes right here, right now, are universal. In fact, if we take a really, really hard look at our own behavior, we'll find exactly the barbarism and savagery that we recognize so easily in others. Okay, th that's great. Um, I think that's just one. Good, thank you. Thank you. Now, I wish we had another hour to, to talk about this, but we'll go to questions and answers now. So I think we have one microphone, and uh, if anybody has a question, then we will pose that to Charles. So there's one there. So you mentioned um, how this book began as a sort of a triumphalist, optimistic story in yeah. 2014. And yeah. um, I can sort of guess um, at some of the gaps to fill in mm. in that. But I wonder if you could talk about um, where it's gone since then. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the, the book is, is much truer to the history by not being, this triumph, by not being a triumphalist you know, story. Um, because all of the people in the book lived their lives as a, as a struggle, right? I mean, Boaz was investigated by the FBI as a likely uh, communist. Um, you know, Mead and, and, and Benedict in this sort of secret relationship, um, for a kind of openly secret relationship for, for most of their um, lives. Um, you know, the struggles that, that Hurston faced as an African-American woman in, uh, in the 30s and 40s. Um, so, and, and then even, you know, scientifically or philosophically, the ideas that Boaz and his students were putting forward were seen as incredibly radical and, and, and revolutionary, you know, and, and batty. I mean, what do you mean this is not the greatest country that the world has ever created? How could you, how could you imply, right, that, this, that the thing that we know as civilization might not be as civilized as as we think. You know, so they're taking on the way you organize a museum, the way you teach a geography class in school, the assumptions about race in this society, and the fixedness and biological nature. They're taking on all of that. And if you look at those struggles through the prism of 2019, 2020, they look very familiar, right? Um, you can hear people say things about 
immigration or immigrants that would have been very familiar to the people that Boaz was arguing against at, at the time. There's a kind of, you know, um, neobiologism when it comes to issues of race and identity um, in the United States these days, pushed forward, I have to say, by companies like 23andMe that will give you, you know, allegedly down to the percentage mark what you really truly forever are. And so all of those things were Boaz, Mead, and others living in our present moment. I think they would have said, yeah, th these are not dark chapters in American history. This is a thread that runs through American history. Who counts as a, as a real American? Hi, thanks so hey. much. Yep. Um, I was recently doing some reading on Zora Neale Hurston, and one of the things I read about was Boaz sending her out into the street to measure um, African Americans' heads. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always understood that to be something that social Darwinists did to say, look, these people are smarter, they have different size heads. And so mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that was sort of one of the techniques, right, to use the opposition's tools and practices of gathering data to refute what it was that they mm -hmm. were saying. Yeah. If you could comment on that a yeah, little bit. Yeah, no, that's a, I'm, gl I'm glad you raised that point. It wasn't actually Boaz, it was one of his, um, one of his PhD students who worked with Hurston um, in, in doing some measurements in, in Harlem. Um, uh, so that version of what, we would, what would now just be called physical anthropology um, was, was very common. Right, I mean, it was it was the standard way of taking the say teens and twenties version of big data and trying to distill something from the big from big data. It relied on a couple of foundational articles of faith, and they were that your race is discernible through the physical measurements of your body that your intelligence is somehow discernible through the physical structure of your body. I mean, think about, and this goes back to, the, to French theorists in the 19th century and so on, but think about why we have a mug shot, right? Why, why do we take a photograph from the front and from the side? Well, you might think, well, it's for identification purposes. That's really quite silly. I mean, you better have a, like a, a view from the back, right? If you're trying to really identify somebody on the street, take a picture of them, the back of their head. The modern mugshot is a direct result of some of these ideas that criminality, criminality could be discerned from the structure of one's head and criminality ran in families. And so sort of all of these ideas were very widespread, very, very standard. But Boaz really makes his name in the early part of the 20th century by doing some work on behalf of a thing called the Dillingham Commission, which was put together by Congress to study the effects of immigration on the, the literal American body politic. You know, it's what is immigration doing to American society? This is the height of you know, Ellis Island, of immigration from Eastern and Southern um, Europe. And Boaz goes out to do the physical measurements, to sort of ask, well, yeah, how is American society changing if we measure noses and heads and femur length and, and so forth? And what he discovers is really that there's not anything to discover at all. That all of the categories that he had begun with, categories like Jewish or Slovak or Italian or all of the categories that he's trying to measure in the, on the Lower East Side, don't exist if you just look at phys physical measurements. There's no such thing as a physical Slovak. You know? And that's revolutionary as an idea, because if there's no such thing as the category that we are associating with intelligence, race, criminology, if, if you can't even discern that by measuring someone, how stable are these things that we call races or ethnicities and, and, and so on? How could you inherit a thing that you can't even observe or measure. And that leads to a work of his called On the Instability of Racial Types, which begins this entire discussion about the non-fixedness of race as a category. Questions? <clears throat> some, some years ago, I went to a Kluge talk, and it was about the future of Western civilization, so I figured I should find out about this. <laughs> and the conclusion was, with all the panelists, that the science fiction writers have the mm. best fix on, <laughs> on what is happening. 
And so th that made me feel a lot better as mm -hmm. a star. Yeah. Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But my, so my question is, though, with what's going on with genetics mm -hmm. and some of the, the imaging of how the brain works, mm -hmm. Do you see at some point uh, that anthropology w would come back to typologies? I mean, on this whole other level. Mm. Well, that, that's that's a great question. I have to preface anything I say in this space about not being an expert. I'm not a geneticist. I'm not an expert in any of those any of those areas. Um, but. You know, I do think there's something in the story of this group that can help us weather all of this. And it just begins with the idea of following the data. You know, um, try, to, try to put away your preconceptions about what you ought to see in the data and then allow, allow the data themselves to speak to you while also being really, really skeptical about how you've pre-cooked the data from the very beginning based on the questions that you're you're asking, right? Because think about it. It seemed, you know, a century ago, it seemed absolutely obvious to the leading scientists of the day that uh, crime ran in families, that women were naturally suited to some professions but not to other professions, that the condition of being feeble-minded, as it was called at the time, was best um, responded to by pe keeping people in an institution and allowing them to, you know, make tables and chairs. Um, uh, all of these things were completely taken for granted because the best science of the day told us that those things were, uh, were, were true. And now we think about all of those in very, very different ways, principally because um, people like Boaz and others went around the world and found, as Ruth Benedict said, places where our abnormals, as she put it, function perfectly fine. Where people that one might label deviant in some capacity in this society turn out to be the village chieftain in that society, right? Or turn out to be the person who has a special relationship with the gods in that society, and vice versa. So we ought always to be skeptical, uh, they were saying, about the pre-cooked categories, verities, truths, norms that we're bringing to our, to our understanding of the, of the world. And to live in that space where you're not certain, you're just not certain about um, your own worldview and you live in a way in which you're always open to having it be challenged. Final point on that is any theory of human society any theory of genetics, any theory of um, civilization that just happens to put people like you, whoever you are, <laughs> at the top, be particularly skeptical. <laughs> be particularly skeptical of that vote. <coughs> yeah. All right, are there, is there any, another burning question from anybody? Going once, there you are. I attended uh, uh, your presentation of your earlier book about uh, Istanbul. Yeah. And there you told this kind of personal story how you made this big discovery in this Turkish uh, glass mm. of tea was trembling in your hand, <laughs> this like personal touch. And here you also tell how uh, all these theories came through personal experience of all these people. So I was wondering, could you share any personal uh, story uh, connected to your research? Yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a great uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think there were many moments in working the Mead papers or elsewhere where you come across a document and you think, or an object, and you think um, that is so familiar to me. So you know, Boaz telling Margaret Mead to watch out for her health when she goes to Samoa. It reminded me so much of emails that I write to graduate students when they're off doing, uh, doing field work and so on. Um, but I will tell you of a moment that in which I was incredibly moved and a thing that, that I came across that I hadn't seen published before. It's a, from in, a, in a letter from um, uh, Mead to Benedict. And they have just completed their train journey across the United States um, 
Benedict is getting down from the train near Gallup, New Mexico, where she's going to go to the Zuni Pueblo and spend the summer doing field work. Mead is, she has just finished her PhD. She's never done any field work. She's just going off to her field work site. Of course, neither one of them, 1925, summer of 1925, can possibly know what will await them right, in their life. And Benedict gets off the train, and she's standing there on the quay. And she, Mead and Benedict are looking at each other through the train window. Mead's still on the train to continue to the West Coast, Benedict standing on the train platform. And another train comes by without stopping on the other track and lifts up Benedict's hair um, and as if she's somehow moving. It makes it look like she's moving. The wind from the train is sort of pushing her hair in one direction. And Mead says, at that moment, I knew both that I loved you and that the two of us would always be in harness with each other. Because it's as if she's sort of like this uh, native spirit floating there on the track. And Mead herself is beginning, as the train begins to move, it's like Benedict is moving together. I was incredibly moved by that, really for two, in two ways. One, seeing this moment of people's life when they have no way of knowing what's coming down the track. You know, what, what life will hold for these two women at that moment. And also, the incredible secrecy that had to attend the relationship between the two of them, given the time and given the place. It's absolutely heartbreaking and thrilling at the same time. And you find that in so much of the papers that are, that are here in the Mead Collection of the Library. That's great. I wish we had time for more questions. You've been a good, attentive audience and stayed with us the, the whole time. Nobody's left. That's great. Um, but uh, That's always we, a plus. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it is, really. <laughs> uh, but uh, now I'm going to have to have Charles sit at a table and um, sign copies of the book. And so, um, so I'll have to go straight to do that. Thank you all for coming. Thanks very much, and, and thank Charles again.